Hi, I'm Ani Sophia Jackson. I'm the research resident at Swedish Medical Center here in Seattle, so welcome everyone to Seattle. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to talk today on the surgical management of patients with gastroesophageal reflux and esophageal outflow obstruction. We have no disclosures. Of those patients being considered for a fundoplication for reflux, a small proportion of patients are found to have an esophageal outflow obstruction and or hypertensive lower esophageal sphincter on manometry, oftentimes incidentally so. It has been hypothesized that the hypertensive LES or the outflow obstruction may be a protective mechanism of the LES to hinder acid exposure in the distal esophagus, and therefore, by reducing acid exposure with the fundoplication, the LES defect will be relieved. However, the optimal surgical strategy for these patients is still unclear. There's concern for inducing dysphagia with the fundoplication, and then conversely, concern for inducing more reflux with a myotomy. Esophageal outflow obstruction is defined as an elevated residual LES pressure greater than 15 and sufficient evidence of peristalsis, such that the criteria for achalasia are not met. And then a hypertensive LES is described as a resting LES pressure greater than 43. In this study, we aim to describe the clinical outcomes of patients with esophageal outflow obstruction and or hypertensive LES undergoing a fundoplication for reflux. We hypothesize that patients with esophageal outflow obstruction and or the hypertensive LES and reflux do not have significant dysphagia following their fundoplication and further, a limited myotomy may be beneficial in a subgroup of patients. In order to do this, we did a retro performed a retrospective review at our institution from January 2004 to December 2016. We included all patients who underwent a fundoplication for reflux who on preoperative manometry had a hypertensive LES or a high residual pressure or both. We excluded patients that had the presence of a parasophageal hernia, epiphrenic diverticulum, or motility disorders such as achalasia, scleroderma, diffuse esophageal spasm, or any prior foregut surgery. The outcomes measured at six-month follow-up or longer included global quality of life, as measured by the GERD HRQL score, dysphagia, as measured by a swallowing score taken from a questionnaire that patients answered in clinic, and then any reinterventions for dysphagia, including dilations or surgery. We identified 61 patients that met the inclusion criteria. After the aforementioned exclusion criteria, 46 patients remained with esophageal outflow obstruction and hypertensive LES that received a fundoplication. Of those 46 patients, 38 patients had a fundoplication alone, while eight patients had a fundoplication plus a short myotomy. After patients with incomplete preoperative and postoperative quality of life and swallowing scores were excluded, we were left with 19 patients that had a fundoplication only. We then took a match control group of patients that had a normal LES uh, pressures who underwent a fundoplication for reflux and compared them to the 19. Here we can see the preoperative characteristics of the 38 patients who had a fundoplication alone with their esophageal outflow obstruction and reflux. Their preoperative LES pressure was 37.6 at a median, and they had an elevated residual LES pressure at 16.2, and then an abnormal Demeester score of 30.5. In those 38 patients for which we had quality of life scores available, the GERD HRQL started at 25 and improved significantly to three postoperatively. Uh, interestingly, for the swallowing scores, the fundoplication-only patients had pretty good preoperative swallowing scores with a score of 41.5, um, really demonstrating that they had minimal symptomatic dysphagia complaints preoperatively, but their scores did improve to 45 postoperatively, demonstrating that they had no dysphagia complaints. There were four re-interventions re re within this group. Um, they were all small diameter balloon dilations with a median time to re-intervention of 260 days. As mentioned, we then took those, we, these 19 patients that had complete scores and matched them based on demographics with a control group of patients that had normal LES pressures and underwent a fundoplication for their reflux. Again, of these 19 patients with the esophageal outflow obstruction, they actually had better swallowing scores preoperatively than the patients without the outflow obstruction or the hypertensive LES at 45 and 36, respectively. But both groups 
or had a median uh, post-operative score of 45, demonstrating no dysphagia post-operatively. Their GERD HRQL was improved in both groups, and there were no re-interventions within the control group. But this really demonstrates that the esophageal outflow obstruction patients behave similarly to the patients without esophageal outflow obstruction or a hypertensive LAS after receiving a fundoplication. We then looked specifically at the eight patients that received a myotomy to see if we could discern what characteristics really led to those patients receiving the myotomy. Here in this table, you can see in blue all the characteristics of those eight patients that had a fundoplication and myotomy, and then in the orange-ish color, um, it's the prior uh, data that was presented on the fundoplication alone characteristics for comparison. The patients who received a myotomy had a slightly higher resting LES pressure at 42.9 compared to the 37.6 in the fundoplication group only. And the residual LES pressures and Demeester scores were similar between the two groups. However, the fundoplication and myotomy group had more uh, complaints related to their GERD with the GERD HRQL of 33 compared to 25 in the fundoplication only group. But most importantly, the patients that received a fundoplication and a myotomy had worse swallowing scores, with a preoperative swallowing score of 18, indicating that their subjective dysphagia symptoms were much worse than the group that received the fundoplication only, and this was likely the deciding factor for performing a myotomy in these patients. In the patients that received the fundoplication and myotomy, they had an improvement in both their GERD HRQL and swallowing scores postoperatively with their median swallowing scores suggesting no dysphagia complaints postoperatively, similar to the results we found in the fundoplication only group. There was one reintervention or one patient that required reintervention within this group. Um, she, this patient needed multiple reinterventions, including multiple dilations, eventually leading to a takedown of her hill repair with creation, recreation of a Nissen uh, 15 months post initial surgery. We do realize the limitations of the study, including it's a single institution retrospective review with a relatively small sample size, made even smaller with all the patients lost to follow up. The patients lost to follow up also introduces a potential bias, or patients that don't follow up potentially aren't following up because they're doing great and don't feel like they need to see a doctor. However, we can conclude for this study that following fundoplication, esophageal outflow obstruction, or hypertensive LES patients without significant dysphagia preoperatively had an overall improvement in their GERD HRQL symptom or GERD symptoms and no worsening of their dysphagia. And furthermore, one-year outcomes are similar between the esophageal outflow obstruction patients and those with a normal LES pressure and relaxation, with no difference in reported postoperative dysphagia or quality of life. And patients with a worse symptomatic dysphagia preoperatively were more likely to receive a myotomy, but had similar outcomes to the cohort that received a fundoplication alone. I'll conclude with a beautiful picture of Seattle and then a more accurate picture of Seattle. Okay. So thank you so much. I'll take any questions. Thank you.